Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you doing, brother? Part of the world you're joining from? We are fine, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. Yeah, I'm joining from Kashmir. Oh, mashallah. Yeah, uh, so I got a few questions. Uh, the first question is about uh, the linguistic miracle of the Quran. Uh, what is it exactly? Okay, brother, I think it'll, it'll be best if you keep it to one question because of the number of people at the, in the back chat. So give us the back, best it. question that you think you want us answered from your list. Just two questions, please. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, firstly, this is the question. Uh, what does Quran actually, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tried to say in the Quran that uh, if you are in doubt whether this book is from God, then bring a surah like it. Uh, so, what is exactly the um, the challenge of the Quran? That okay. I mean, when we talk to non-Muslims, it's necessary to explain the actual miracle of the Quran, which is a linguistic miracle of the Quran. Many people pick the scientific miracles; maybe there are, but the actual miracle of the Quran is undoubtedly the linguistic miracle of Quran. So, how should we describe that? Define uh, uh, to a non-Muslim. Yeah. And what's your second question? Second question is uh, regarding how to, uh, you know, satisfy the atheists that uh, something cannot come into existence from nothing. These are the two questions. Okay. Um, Yemeni, uh, oh, who is, where's Brandon gone? Um, has he lost connection? Yeah, he's got some connection issues. Why didn't you answer the first question, Mansoor? And then uh, mm -hmm. Yemeni can take the second one, inshallah. Okay. So... <sighs> I would recommend you to actually read some books um, which explains it in more detail and some of our discussions that we've had already on this subject from Speakers Corner videos. But in a nutshell, what the Quran is basically challenging is people when they're saying that this is not from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? Think about the context. There are people who are saying the Prophet Sallallahu has forged it, he's invented it, he's made it up himself. It's not a revelation. Okay? That's the backdrop that's the background so so basically the accusation is the prophet sallallahu has somehow made the quran by himself by copying other things or some people helping others and so on so it's a human product so the challenge of the quran is basically to if this was the case then human beings should be able to make something like that like what he's made okay so this is the context of understanding the challenge it's not about the greatest of all the creator the almighty challenging the creation who's insignificant how is that fair i mean if you look at a boxer in, in going to a boxing ring and you have a five-year-old against in a heavier champion it's not a fair fight right it's not a fair challenge but here it's not like this it's not god challenging with all his might and so on bring something like it it's god is bringing this forward look you people claim that the quran is a human product okay so the challenge is right. bring something like this which you consider a human product so it's a like for like it's a fair challenge because you should be able to imitate the quran because it's also coming from according to your understanding and human being or a collective of human beings okay so that's a fair challenge and is this challenge unfair from the grounds of what it's asking for no it's not asking you to bring something to someone which is beyond their abilities. It's in the Arabic language, challenging the people who are speaking the Arabic language, who have learned the Arabic language or expert in the language, to bring something like the product, which is the Quran, to, in front of them. So it has its own, say, style of presentation, like any literature. Literature comes in different forms, as you know already. So it can come from in the form of a no rhymes and rhythms, we called it prose, or it could come with specific rhymes and meters, which is known as poetry, um, poems, in which you don't just do free form altogether. Maybe sometimes now free form is a type of poetry, but generally speaking, in Arabic repertoire, in Arabic uh, linguistics and literature from the pre-Islamic Arabia, for them there is a particular way of rhyming, having meters to their speech that gives them that eloquence, that beauty, that, that rhyme which they call shi'ar, poetry for example. 
And the Quran came in its own linguistic genre, in its own linguistic form. Yeah. So what the Quran is saying, you know how to compose using the alphabet in your language from Alif to Ya. You know how to make prose and poetry, sayings of the Sutsas. You know how to make the, the, the you know, when you say khutbah, you know, like uh, sermon, things like that. So you're able to compose by manipulating the letters into words and phrases and sentences and paragraphs uh, in, in, a, in a coherent manner. And that is something that's really, really, you, you take pride in. You'd hang the best of them in the world of the Kaaba. Okay, that's how they're capable of. So from that understanding, the Quran is saying, here is a composition. You should be able to make something like it because you are so good in your composition of this kind of literature, poetry. And you had so many of these types. You have made it into a particular rule. So it has to either follow Al-Madid, Al-Khafif, Al-Tawil, Al-Basit. These are specific rhymes and meters of these kind of compositions. So here is the Quran. Go make something like it. Okay. I mean, we've got options of having make the whole Quran or 10 chapters or one chapter. Um, you know, the, the, the challenge is out there. I mean, if you can make, even imitate one chapter, you've met the challenge. Okay. So what exactly, your question is, what exactly is the nature of the Quran in which people are asked to imitate, to compose? What exactly is the Quran? So this is where the response comes in. We say it is not only about eloquence. Eloquence is a big part of it. And all the classical scholars um, of Arabic linguistics and literature of uh, and so on, they, they talked about, and higher criticism, literary criticism, they talked about it. And eloquence is a big part of this message because you're not talking about someone, a child speaking gibberish, but someone really eloquent speech. So what exactly we are saying, number one, it's not a subjective criteria or a subjective challenge. I'm going to bring Brother Morris in. Assalamu alaikum. Oh. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Maurice. It's not a subjective challenge in which people, their, you know, the appreciation of that particular composition is felt emotionally, aesthetically. Like they feel, oh, it's great. Uh, it's so, you know, you know, mind um, is boggling. It's something that mesmerizing. No, we're not talking about that aspect. We're talking about a linguistic composition which can be objectively shown to have a specific style or stylistics. In Arabic, it's called uslub. In plural, it's called asalib. Okay? So we are now dealing with the structure of the language rather than the meaning and the eloquence that is derived from that text. I, I hope you're making the distinction. One is you have the syntax and you have the semantics. We are talking about the syntax of the text, the structure, the composition, the placement of verbs and particles, the placements of noun, whether it's actually a verbal sentence or a nominal sentence. Okay, jumla, ismiya, khabariya, or inshia. We are talking about the syntax, the composition. Okay, we are talking about how it's constructed, the words placed within the particular sentence structure or paragraph, not the meaning that is derived from it, and you find this meaning profound in you know, philosophical, sociological, historical, scientific understanding. I'm not going there yet. I'm just talking about the simple construction of the text, okay? You imagine like you're looking at a Chinese text and you don't even know the meaning, but they, you've been told this is how it's constructed. You have words here and you have preposition here, and this is how it goes. Rules and regulations. So the Quran, seems on a closer inspection that it doesn't conform to any of the known Arabic syntax of their poetry, um, of their literature, in which you have specific rhymes and meters. So I mentioned a few of them earlier on. Al-Khafif, Al-Madid, Al-Tawil, Al-Basit. Okay, you'll, be, you'll get familiarized with this Bihar, okay, the seas in Arabic poetry. 16 is known. 13 plus 3 by Khalil Ahmed Farah, added 3 if I'm not mistaken. So 16 Bihar. So these are specific 
stylistics of how you compose poetry. The Quran doesn't fit into those, even though some academics might say, oh, there's some elements of sajah here and there, some elements of rhyme prose here and there. But this is something like, you know, coincidental because of course there will be rhymes, but you will try to fit that this rhymes fit into any of the 16, but overall context, it's not sajah. Okay, it's not any of these 16. Okay, so the, the challenge is quite simple to bring something like this Quran, imitate something like this Quran, in which, excuse me, in which you have that stylistic imitated. Okay, so how is the stylistics? By looking at the Quran, you can see that. You might not see it quite obviously because we are so much into this every day we read and re read and hear about it you can't think about it but when you look at it at, on, a, on a deep reflection you'll find the composition the way it is it's not how the arabs used to speak number one it's not how the prophet used to speak it's not how the companion used to speak so you have three genres you have the non-muslims who had their speech and the quran doesn't speak like them you had the believing muslims they don't speak like that. You have the Prophet ﷺ, his speech, which we have now collected in various forms and various degrees of authentication in our hadith literature, from sahih to da'if, for example, from the authentic to the weak. When we compare the speech of the Quran to all of this speech, as well as the speech of the Jahiliya poetry, pre-Islamic poetry, many of which, which has survived in you know, compositions of, you know, oral transmission and their people have transmitted and made commentaries out of it. So you can find all these Jahiliya poetries and you can find data without this. You'll be astonished to see how the Quran is not like that kind of speech. So we know the Quran is unlike them. How it's unlike them is exactly in the composition, in the structure, in the stylistics, in the tarkib, and so on and so forth. So when non-Muslims want to know how to imitate it, is to know how the Quran is like, and then imitate like it. So if you were to pick up a small chapter and you, you look at it, you can analyze the form it is in, in the stylistics, okay? How does it start? Does it start with an affirmative, you know, a, 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 a question particle, like, you know, it's a, 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 not a particle, you know, we say, hal or a, does it start with a questioning um, letter? Like, I've, I've forgotten the grammatical term for it. And then does it follow with a noun or a verb? And then the proposition, position of it, how does it go? How does it even connect between um, the, the semantic way it is related? Does it have a shift? It is known as iltifat, okay? A, a, a shift within, does it go from one person to another person, from one uh, you know, case marker to another case marker? Does it make that kind of semantic shift? So all of this can be analyzed. And the book that I want to recommend is by Bassam Sa'i, Bassam Sa'i, his original book in Arabic is called Al Mu'ajita, but the English one, an abridged translation, is called The Miraculous Language of the Quran. If you give me one second, I'll just bring it. And in the meantime, um, uh, Brother Muris, Salaamu Alaikum, how are you doing? Alaikum Salaam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. We're doing really well. Um, mashallah, beautiful explanation. Alhamdulillah. Thanks for joining, bro. I'm, so, I'm Mir, you know, the best thing is okay. if so, these questions. It are something that you're unable okay. to answer yourself best to ask you know yeah. direct them to people who can answer like brother mansoor and so on okay Shabba. so this is book number one. Oh, i need to stop the Could you... blurring in my background one second you'll see it clearly inshallah okay so this is published by iiit international institute of islamic thought It's a very small booklet as you can see okay the miraculous language What's of the, the Quran. Name of the, book? Hmm? the miraculous What's language. The name of the book? That's what I'm saying. As you can see after the graphics, it's called the miraculous language of the Quran. Yeah. Evidence of divine origin. So it's an English abridged translation of these two books. Okay. The first one, sure. this is volume one, Mu'ajiza. Okay. The second sure. one, Mu'ajiza, as you can see. The size of this book. The first book is the methodology, this one. And the second one is the application. 
So in the first book, he tells you exactly how objectively the Quran is unlike any of the form of literature, why uh, Quran can be, can or cannot be imitated. And second book, he applies that objective criteria and applies it to several small chapters and one big chapter and shows how the Quran is unique in its form and it surpasses the number of words within each chapter has unique novelties more than the unique. Okay, let me rephrase again. The number of unique literary features within any chapter of the Quran is far beyond, is more than the number of words in any chapter of the Quran. So if a chapter is 10 words, you'll, you'll find a linguistic novelty, linguistic feature that is more than 10 words. If a chapter has 100 words, the linguistic features, the newness, the novelty will be more than 100 words. So that's how he demonstrates objectively by application of his methodology in the second book. So this is what we should be recommending to everyone, Muslims and non-Muslims, when they're interested in an objective way of assessing the Quran's inimitability. If somebody says, I don't know Arabic, well, then go and get support from someone who does. There are a lot of people who are not Muslims and they study Arabic in an academic setting. There may be a professor um, of Arabic language in different universities um, around the world. So let them do it, okay? This is an objective no, the... academic type challenge. It's not a challenge for the lay person. The lay people, if they really want to um, engage with the challenge, all they need to know is this is a challenge that's been going there for more than 1400 years and people are failing. So for them, uh, it's the, that the academics are failing. They're not even attempting. So how would a lay person even be, you know, at, trying to attempt something like that? There are some online videos who are claiming that they have created some uh, surahs. If you yeah, could, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm if familiar you have... with most of them. So what? If you're ever engaging with them, ask them. Okay. So here is, uh, were the objective criteria. Number one, which surah they're imitating? And how are they meeting this objective criteria? Sufficient. Okay. That should be sufficient. Okay. We don't need and to be the judge. The... They can be the judge themselves. Okay. Now is the second question uh, I would like to ask Brother Hashim. Yeah, we're going to say Brother Yemeni to answer Inshallah first and then the Brother Maurice. So, um, Brother Maurice, you'll, you'll enjoy this conversation. How do we answer the atheist when they say something can come out of nothing? I don't understand them. They don't make any sense. <laughs> um, so, yeah, honestly, what they try to do is they try to put us on the back foot. And the way that they do that is by saying, well, if you can't prove your position to be true, then my position must be true. And that's just not the way to approach stuff. So the same way that they're tasking you to prove your position to be true you should also be tasking them to prove their position true. And if you listen to Brother Sabur, he does a wonderful job of uh, asking them what's the assumed mechanism that you're using in your formula to get to your conclusion. And what you'll find is if you can look through his discussions with like evolutionary biologists, you can look through his discussions with like geneticists and so on. They always have a, a presupposition to something, which means that the way that they're building their um, <clears throat> premises and the way that they're building their worldview is by inserting something, assuming that it is true. And then they kind of work around to, to glue the pieces together and say, well, look, this works, right? And uh, that may be satisfactory to some people, but to me personally, that's not satisfactory because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran multiple times to reflect on the on this, like, did you create yourselves and are you following nothing but conjecture? And are you upon certainty? Did you get some form of revelation or some scripture that I that I gave to you? And naturally the answer is no. <clears throat> so um, I, I think, you know, if you're doing the tadabur of the Quran and you, you really come across these verses, you'll see exactly how uh, mankind is formulating their own scriptures. And to me, what hits my heart is uh, especially that verse where he says, are you upon some type of scripture or do you have something from the unseen that's not for me? And uh, you'll see that these folks, these scientists are trying their best to peer behind the veil and to, to make work of some type of an amalgamation of some model 
that even these models are um, not only are they completely incorrect because obviously atheism is false, uh, but the the methods that they take are just um, so, for lack of a better word, not smart. It's just a bunch of people trying to act smart by giving some type of uh, explanation to how something could potentially be and accepting it for the truth rather than just going based off of what's simple and what's easy, which is that there is indeed a necessary cause and that there is indeed a primary mover that started everything. And here we are today. So it really depends on, uh, I'm not sure to what angle you were asked this question, but to me, atheism just, it doesn't hold any water. It's more of a game of ego and trying to do like a mental flex, a mind flex by saying really complex words and theorizing off of imponderables, but, you know, accepting it to be true without any evidence. So. Uh, hopefully that helps you kind of better understand. Um, I'm not sure if you were, were you asked this by somebody and now you were kind of stumped or what was the, what's the history behind this question? Uh, I have seen many atheists claiming that something can come into existence from nothing. So that was the question. Uh, can, how, how could we satisfy an atheist that something cannot come into existence from nothing? They are saying that um, so far we haven't seen something coming into existence from nothing, maybe in the future we would see. Okay. So if they want to take that gamble, uh, that's entirely up to them. I think it's a very foolish gamble. So if you were to ask them if something didn't come from nothing from the dawn of time, what makes you think that in another, what, 13.4 billion years, something is going to come from nothing? You know, do you have 13.4 billion years to figure it out? You know, what's the, what's the wager? And oh, that's simply, a good point. Yeah, simply just tell them if you can't present any type of evidence that something did come from nothing, then what? And you've had all this time. Why? Why would you gamble it going forward? And when you have clear evidence that something did come from something, you can use any type of reasoning, induction, deduction. You can. You know what I'm saying? So they're not using their faculties of of thinking. It's just a plain, it's ironically plain faith that they're basing their question on. They're, they're believing that something is going to happen in the future. It's like, okay, dude, well, I've got evidence that something happened in the past. So what's stronger, you know, your faith or <laughs> it's just silly. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Brother Yemeni, do you want to add something to it? Sorry. Um... Just, yeah, just quickly. So the thing is, is that all of these atheists and and physicists and stuff, uh, you know, all of these people that claim that something can come from nothing, they actually define nothing as something. So they actually don't actually believe in absolute nothingness bringing about something. The nothing that they refer to is something that they haven't yet detected. That's what it is. Right. So that's what they mean by nothing. That's a good, great point, Brother Yemeni. A very good point. And so, um, just, not, oh, go. nothing doesn't even exist. It's a concept. Yeah, it is a concept. Yeah. So if something doesn't exist, how can it bring about something that does exist? Think about it. It's illogical from any angle. I will also say, just to touch back on the previous point in regards to the uh, majesty of the Quran, I put some stuff in the private chat for you from an article uh, that was dated a while back, but it shows all of the um, not all of them, but most of the rhetorical features that this gentleman found within the Quran, and it gives you references. So everything from analogies, alliterations, antiphrases, antithesis, um, cadence, and it's he gives you the reference to what chapter of the Quran that he found it in. And I'm sure that there's many more Allah Alam, but um, that's one of the examples of the, the complexity of something like this actually coming together and how it just simply just can't be done, um, you know, especially by an illiterate individual who did not have contact with something outside of himself. And yeah, just, just to, thank just you to, for your response. Just to show you on the screen, when we talk about nothing, there are actually nine levels of nothingness, okay? We talk about nothingness on level nine. 
it's not just simply empty space, uh, space, you know, emptiness or no objects and particles. We are even talking about no vacuums or no virtual particles, level five. So level five is something where everything comes from, according to the scientist. Lawrence Krauss in his book, The Universe from Nothing, is actually on level four, okay? Even though there's no matter or radiation of fields, but there actually, there are vacuums, there are quantum fluctuations and virtual particles coming from there. So as you can see, they're not talking about nothing as in philosophical nothingness, as we say, which is level nine. They're only talking about something that also exists in their nothingness, space exists, time exists, laws of nature exist. In their nothingness from which something comes, non-physical entities, abstract concepts, abstract ideals, numbers, sets, logics, truth exist, and so does the possibilities. So they're not talking about nothing, they're talking about some type of nothing which is an, a concept to make them you know, deceived um, to think that yes, it's possible when our concept of nothingness is ultimate nothingness, absence of everything. Okay, so I hope you know that that would clarify. You know, when scientists and atheists talk about nothingness, they don't actually mean nothingness as we mean, because they know the moment we talk about and we agree on the same concept, their game is over before it begins. And just just on the thank you, it was helpful. And just on the subject of the eloquence of the Quran or the challenge of the Quran. If uh, I'm just posting in the uh, in the chat the title of the book in Arabic uh, for anyone that does want to say, uh, Mansour, this is the book that you're referring to, you know, Yeah, that's the one yeah, on the that's screen. The, that's the one, yeah. So yeah. that's that one. And also, um, and, and this this small series benefited me. Um, what do you call it? And to be honest, it is a, it's a small series that you've done, Mansour, four years ago. On mm. on this on this subject, so I'm posting that in the in the chat as well because um, uh, you know it's uh, Mansour. Uh, you've done I think three parts, or is it three four parts? parts? Yeah. Three parts, yeah. Um, on this very subject, and it's condensed in a way that's very easy for the you know the general public to to understand. Uh, so that's something yeah. for you to look at as well. I, I, at last, I would like to have a request if 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 uh, if it's uh, possible for you, if you could start a series on this, you know, the ling miraculous nature of the Quran, that would be highly yeah, generous. That, that, that three part lecture is that kind of introduction in depth. <laughs> let, let me put it introduction because I summarized as much as possible. And with me on the part three was Brother Muhammad Ali from Muslim Lantern. I'm sure you, you love him. So we'll enjoy yeah. listening to him um, on, on part three as well. Okay. So do um, have a listen to the three-part lecture series on the inimitability, on the actual miraculous nature of the Quran, in which we touched on in detail the linguistic inimitability uh, of the Quranic text, why it's not possible to match. So people often bring, uh, you know, examples forward without even understanding what is the challenge itself. Imagine I asked you to bring me a pen like this. Okay, sorry, I need to uh, unblur my background. Just put it in front of you. <laughs> yeah, so if I say bring a pen like this, okay? You okay. See? And you bring something like that. Is this like it? No. Yeah, there's lots of unlikeness yeah lots of dissimilarities so it doesn't fit so if you bought something like it another pen like it you'll say oh okay it looks the same i haven't got this pen i should have bought another pen exactly the same it will say yeah that you know looks like the same color is the same imagine okay that's the second pen yeah from the first pen when you compare it it's the size the shape the color the texture everything looks the same that will how you be something like it but what they bring is Something that it even they, they haven't got to even clue how like a surah they're bringing. You need to make that comparison. You have to make it like it. The Quran says, "Fatu bimithlihi," bring something like it. That's the key point. Okay, and it brother. Has to also, it has to also convey meaning and have rhetorical devices. I mean, it, there's so much that is in the wazan, like in the scale of what it requires 
that uh, I just think people don't actually really recognize and go into, well, what actually is the Quran? What is the Quran doing? What? Why did it shock the, the Arabs so much when they heard it? To where even polytheists, pagans were like, yeah, this is this is from Allah. <laughs> There's no way this is from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, Mir Rasik, we have to let you go because other people are waiting. And uh, thank you for your questions you, and coming you. to our stream. Uh, Allah bless you, you and help you to spread the message of Islam, inshallah.